Welcome to Hot Chips 29. Session 5, FPGA. So this first session is centered around FPGAs, and I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, Brendan Farley, comes the senior director at Xilinx from Ireland, and he's going to talk to you today about interconnects and FPGAs. Brendan. Thanks, Rob. Good morning, everybody. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the integration of RF data converters with the uh, FPGA, and that's something that's kind of unusual, I guess, for Xilinx, but I'll go through the ra rationale as to why we would want to do that and some of the technological uh, features associated with that. We did make a technology announcement in February of this year where we announced the RF SOC. Uh, it's based on our 16 nanometer uh, platform. Uh, so um, today, um, first of all, I'm going to talk about um, why we would integrate RF data converters into the FPGA. And um, I don't want to alarm Surday's, two pe uh, Surday's people too early in the morning, but um, I'm not talking about completely replacing, replacing Surday's here, but it's really just one standard, which is the JESD 204B standard, uh, which is required to talk to external data converters. And in our view, in wireless, uh, you know, RF data converters are the new Surday's for that application. Uh, the second thing is that once you've integrated these RF data converters into the FPGA, um, you can really integrate and move the analog RF features that were originally on the board. You can implement them in the digital domain, which gives you all the advantages of power, cost, flexibility, um, etc. Um, I'll move on then to talk about the RF SOC device itself. Uh, so uh, the features on the fabric side um, and on the data converter side. And then finally, I'll talk about the applications associated with the RF SOC. So in wireless, RF data converters are the new surdays. And uh, why would I be saying that? Um, well, here um, I'm illustrating um, two state-of-the-art RF data converters that we implemented and presented at ISSCC earlier this year. Um, the first one uh, is from Christoph Erdmann. Um, and it's a 6.4 gigasample per second RF DAC implemented in 16 nanometer technology. Uh, the second one is uh, an ADC um, operating at 4 gigasamples per second, and again, implemented in uh, 16 nanometer technology. Now, you can see in these RF systems, uh, when you use an RF data converter, um, the signal comes in through the antenna, um, in through a PA, and then a bandpass filter, and then it gets digitized, um, for example, here through the um, A to D converter directly, and then um, the digital data is moved uh, to the FPGA fabric. Um, now, the issue here is that, um, as, we, as we see, the signal starts off in the RF analog domain. Um, it then gets digitized by the data converter, um, but then what we do in surdays is we move the data across an interface using effectively an analog um, signal processing technique. So we go from analog to digital, um, back to analog, and then back to digital inside the, uh, the FPGA. So it is inherently wasteful, and that surdays power is something that you cannot afford to use and waste um, in uh, 5G wireless applications. Um, the other key point here is that you'll notice that the power consumption of the data converters is much lower than the power consumption of the Surdays interface itself. So in fact, it's costing you more to move the data across the interface than it is to actually digitize the RF signal in the first place. So um, the reason for that, um, um, and you know, just to say, I suppose, if this continues, uh, you know, uh, the interface power is, is becoming really the, the limiting factor in the overall system design. 
uh, in 5G wireless, uh, we'll have wider and wider bandwidths to support, and we'll have more and more channels uh, to deploy uh, within a system. And you know, why um, have the surdays become the bottleneck in the system? Um, so Boris Merman uh, from Stanford plots the uh, performance improvements of RF data converters um, with respect to time every year. Uh, he plots all of the data, the figure of merits for the data converters uh, coming from VLSI, ISSCC, etc. And what we see is that there is a continuous improvement in power efficiency uh, over time in data converters. Rapid improvements over the last 10 years or so. And what we've also seen is the data converters themselves have moved from hundreds of mega samples to gigasamples per second. Um, so uh, essentially, we're getting an increasingly efficient implementation of data converters in the digital domain. Um, on the other side, the efficiency of the I.O. hasn't improved as much. There has been a strong focus on, remo on reducing the number of pins and uh, scaling down the interface. But the actual power dissipation itself has not seen the same level of improvement over time as with the data converters. And what I'm showing in the lower plot there is actually a notional 2 gigasample uh, 12 bit A to D converter. So, you know, 20 years ago they weren't uh, available. But if I use a figure of merit for the time, I can show what the power dissipation 20 years ago would have been if it was possible to do a 2 gigasample per second data converter and how that's improved over time to actual data converter uh, implementations of recent years. And what you can see again from the plot is that the improvement in the data converter power has far exceeded the improvement in I.O. power. And actually, as I showed in the previous slide, that it actually um, is lower. It costs lower, less power to digitize the ORF than it does to move the data across the interface. OK, so um, for that reason, I would suggest that in wireless, we should remove the Surday's interface um, and really just monolithically integrate these ORF data converters into the FPGA. Um, now, once you've done that, uh, what this does then is it opens up the possibility to take the analog ORF that used to be on the board and to map that into the digital domain. When we move to 16 nanometers, not only do we get better analog performance, but we also get improved digital performance in terms of power, speed, um, and area and cost efficiency. Um, so what I'm showing here is two implementations of a radio on the receive side. Um, so what you can see is that in the top graph, um, we'll say in 5G at the moment, uh, band 42, which is three and a half gig carrier, that's um, going to be a very significant band for 5G in China. And um, what we can see is that, the, again, the three and a half gig signal come in a traditional radio system the three and a half gig signal comes in through the low noise amplifier, it then gets frequency shifted down to some manageable frequency in the baseband. So for example, if that's three and a half gig, if the local oscillator is running at three gig, well, that band will get shift down, shifted down to three and a half minus three gig, which is 500 megahertz. At that point, you will digitize your 500 megahertz band, and then you would implement everything in the digital domain. And that makes the requirements of the A to D quite relaxed. And it also means that your, your digital design is running at lower frequencies. Um, the problem with this approach, though, is that, as you can see, that's a custom RF analog implementation at the front end. Um, it's extremely expensive in terms of size, power, and cost. It can only handle a single band. Um, but on the plus side, you do have a relaxed data converter spec. Now, with the emergence of RF data converters, Instead of requiring this ORF frequency shifting stage here, which again is custom and it's expensive, what we do is we take the three and a half gig signal right at the input and we digitize that directly. Um, so what that means now is that we've got a very flexible, low power, uh, wideband, which is extremely important for 5G, wideband implementation. It's very low size. Um, uh, low power, it reduces the system cost, the whole board shrinks down. Um, the downside is that you have the very demanding RF data converter specification. Um, so up to 6.4 gigasamples per second on the RF SOC. It also means that the digital design, now instead of running at a few hundred mega, megahertz um, with the traditional approach, 
you're actually running at gigahertz um, on the digital side as well. But that is the advantage of 16 nanometer, that you can really implement RF functionality more cost effectively and with lower power in the digital domain now that you can than in the RF analog domain. So why are we able to do this um, in 16 nanometer technology? Well, first of all, and surprisingly, um, analog transistor characteristics are excellent in 16 nanometer uh, process. In particular, um, the on resistance of a switch. So the resistance that's presented to a signal uh, once the switch is turned on is extremely low. And what that means is that you've got, it, it allows you to have a very wide signal bandwidth. And you can digitize with great degrees of accuracy those gigahertz uh, RF carriers that are coming in. Also, what it allows you to do is implement very high speed um, basic analog components like comparators, uh, switches, amplifiers, clocking circuits. Now, you may not get the accuracy, um, but that's where the digital comes in, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, there are some challenges um, on the uh, analog side. So, for example, you do have a very low analog power supply, uh, so 0.925 uh, volt power supply, which means from a power integrity and signal-to-noise ratio perspective, it's, it's still quite a challenging design. Also, if you're going to monolithically integrate these data converters in 16 nanometers with a very noisy fabric, uh, you really need a very uh, robust isolation strategy to allow you to uh, be immune from that, that noise. On the digital side, uh, we've got really high-density logic now available with very low power. Um, so what that enables you to do then is, okay, you have these analog components that are really high speed, but they're very inaccurate. You've traded speed for accuracy. So what you can do then is use the digital calibration or digital logic to calibrate all of those analog components. And this is a very efficient uh, way to implement very wideband RF data converters. Uh, so for example, it is quite complex. I mean, these are very complex closed loop algorithms. There's 150K logic gates associated with each A to D converter for our calibration. There are many, many loops to calibrate inside that A to D, and that's done both at the foreground and the background. Um, this um, digital logic it also allows you to implement this RF, digital RF that I talked about earlier. So replacing that analog RF, like analog mixers, um, analog oscillators, and implementation of those in the digital domain, hardened digital logic associated with the RF data converters. Um, again, on the digital side, there's lots of uh, challenges here as well. Um, the digital analog verification, I talked about the, uh, the closed loop uh, algorithms and convergence of those algorithms. Um, you know, there are huge challenges um, trying to predict how those uh, algorithms will converge with both an analog and digital components. Also, power integrity. In 16 nanometers, you've got this quite large metal stack, and uh, you're dissipating quite a lot of power in a small area, so there's significant power integrity challenges associated uh, with the implementation of the digital logic. Um, as a metric, uh, what we're seeing at the moment is that moving from, 60, from 65 nanometers to 16, there's about a 10x area reduction and at least a 4x power reduction, if not more. Okay, so how do we deal with some of those challenges in 16 nanometers for the hardened logic? Well, on the digital side, one of the things I mentioned was the power integrity. Associated with each um, quad of A to D converters or D to A to converters, so we arrange these data converters as quads. Um, there's about one and a half million instances of digital logic that's been hardened and synthesized. And that has to operate above a gigahertz. Um, and on the physical side, we have a 13 layer metal stack with very high resistance uh, lower metals. So things like EMIR closure, uh, very important but very tricky, um, and power supply noise. So again, you're operating a very low uh, power supply and trying to maintain the power integrity of your design is very important. What we did find interestingly was that in 16 nanometers, the digital uh, dynamic power starts to be dominated by glitch power. So what I mean by glitch power is as the logic propagates, there is intermediate states. Uh, so you, um, and that results in excess power being dissipated. And what we're seeing in the synthesis tools is actually that because the logic gates have such small delays, the depth of logic, the logic can be quite deep. So you end up with this, these uh, lots of intermediate states as you go from one flop to the next. Um, so glitch power optimization is something that we um, 
put a lot of effort into. And we, uh, we did develop this, this flow where essentially we've got parameterizable RTLs that determines how many pipelines to insert, insert into, your, uh, into your design. Uh, we then, that's a parameter then can be passed to design compiler. Um, we simulate the gate Verilog. Uh, we remove some of the, uh, the hold violations and we run the, ver the Verilog uh, simulations. Um, then we look at the switching activity and we pick out um, the obvious glitching activity that's happening and we feedback that to the design compiler. So for example, an activity factor of two is a clock. An activity factor of one or less is normal. But some activity factor that's greater than one but not two is probably some glitching that's going on inside the circuitry. So we do an analysis of those glitches and we look at the, um, at the power dissipation and we're able to optimize them with respect to the pipelines. On the analog side, um, the co-verification of the analog and digital is extremely um, important, as I said. We have thousands of cycles, digital cycles. The normal way to validate um, analog digital is perhaps to run some sort of a cosim, but that's completely um, unrealistic for the type of verification that we need to do. So we focused on real number modeling, um, and we modeled essentially right down to a basic component level, like a comparator or an amplifier or a switch, et cetera. Then what we did was we had a flow whereby we could netlist out from the analog schematics the real number models. Um, and then we ran uh, the real number, uh, uh, and then we ran those simulations. Uh, we were able to validate the real number models using COSIM, so it's important to calibrate the real number models with the actual uh, analog uh, circuits. And then from a performance perspective, you can see there's a massive improvement in performance from a verification point of view. Uh, so we were able to run 16 parallel blocks, large parallel blocks, um, in about five minutes compared to COSIM of a single block that would take about 16 hours. So this is the kind of verification that you really need to implement when you've got these complex uh, closed-loop uh, digital analog systems. Okay, so I'll move on to the device itself now. Um, and how we got there was that we started about um, four years ago or so. We published at ISSCC um, an integrated... Um, device where we had a 28 nanometer uh, fabric integrated with uh, data converters implemented in 65 nanometers. Um, that was uh, implemented using a silicon interposer and we had um, 500 mega sample A to Ds and 1.6 uh, gigasample DACs. Um, now, um, after that then we realized that to be really uh, to to have broad market appeal, the monolithic integration was very important, in particular around cost. So 3D integration is not an inexpensive technology. Um, and also what we could see was that the 16 nanometer process itself was very good for analog, and we could really scale down the data converters moving to those, uh, that technology. Um, so the RF SOC is a fully monolithic integration of RF data converters with the fabric. Um, it's implemented in 16 nanometer FinFET. Uh, we have 12 bit 4 gigasample A to D converters and 14 bit 6.4 gigasample DACs. And what we saw going from the 16, 65 nanometer designs to the 16 nanometer design for the equivalent performance, we saw a 10x reduction in power and a 20x reduction in area. So essentially, you've got a very cost effective low power integration of the ORF with the, uh, with the 16 nanometer uh, process. And as I said earlier, we published both of those data converters this year at ISSCC. Um, in terms of the resources, um, so it's integrated with our Ultrascale Plus um, fabric, and the requirements really are targeting communications applications. Uh, first of all, DSP is extremely important in wireless, for example. So we maximize the programmable DSP bandwidth per channel. Um, most of these applications are passively cooled, so you really need a power of less than about 35 watts um, on the device. Uh, we have embedded the uh, Ultrascale Plus uh, processing subsystem, um, and that is used, for example, for coefficient of uh, calculations in the DSP, uh, calculation coefficients of DSP, and we've also introduced the, uh, the surdays. We have uh, 32 gigabit per second surdays integrated with this device. Um, we've also got high densities of DSP slices and uh, system logic cells, and we have the processor subsystem. So it's a quad-core ARM53 uh, running at 1.5 gigahertz, and then we've also got the real-time uh, processing units as well. 
on the digital ORF resources side of things, um, so what I'm illustrating here is the sub-6 gigahertz spectrum for 5G. And um, traditionally, the cellular um, operators have operated from zero to about, say, 2.7 gigahertz. Um, there's a new band that's opening up now, band 42 and band 43, especially in China, around 3.5 gigahertz. And then later on, uh, there will be other new bands operating and opening up right up to six gigahertz. Um, so we have these arrays of data converters that digitize the spectrum up to about four gigahertz for RFSOC. RF -SOC. We've also got an integrated low noise, low phase noise PLL. So when you integrate these high data rates, uh, data converter, uh, you need on-chip clocking to, to enable the clocking of those uh, uh, components. We have full complex mixers, so we've replaced the ORF mixers that would normally appear on the board uh, with these uh, complex mixers. Uh, so numerically controlled oscillator per uh, DAC and ADC. We've also got implemented digital uh, decimation and inter interpolation filters, um, some quadrature uh, modulator correction, um, and some other filters, and then a flexible fabric interface. So all of, this, all of these features have been hardened in the tiles, and then there's a fabric interface um, to, the, uh, to the FPGA itself. Um, so how would I, how would I configure uh, these data converters? Uh, so we have a configuration wizard for the initial settings. Uh, so as you can see here, for example, uh, we configure the RF ADC with a sample rate of four giga samples per second, um, and uh, we use Linux drivers then to, if there's something that needs to be dynamically updated during the runtime, we can use drivers running on, uh, on Linux to update the configuration settings of the, for example, you might want to change the, uh, the NCO frequency. Um, so you can do that at runtime. Uh, we have Axi4 Lite for configuration and Axi4 Stream for data interface uh, to the fabric. Okay, so the last section here is just to talk about some of the applications um, that we're using uh, for this ORF SOC. So um, as was already disclosed at our analyst meetings, this device is being sampled at the moment to some of our lead customers. Um, the primary applications for this um, technology are uh, communications. Uh, so in particular, radio. Radio drives the hardest requirements in the market from a performance perspective and from a cost perspective. Um, so radio is a central and primary um, application use case. Um, and as we move to 5G, we'll have wider and wider bandwidths. So we're moving from like 60 or 80 megahertz to 200 megahertz with band 42, band 43. And then when we get to millimeter wave, we'll be up at a gigahertz of bandwidth. And we'll have many, in, many of these channels. Uh, so radio really drives the technology. Um, another one, though, is cable. So those central office um, head ends are being replaced by distributed architecture, whereby you've got a box that talks to maybe 64 residential units. Inside that box, you've got a remote FI, a cable remote FI, uh, which is used to connect directly to those households. Um, got similar requirements, actually, to, uh, to wireless. Um, the other one is backhaul, so wireless backhaul. And then, you know, also benefiting from the technology, though, is uh, secondary applications like test and measurement, um, imaging, in particular security. So you know those scanners that you go through at the airport, they contain thousands of these data converters. Um, and aerospace and defense, in particular radar. So radar is undergoing a, a, a similar architectural shift to wireless in the sense that the analog beamforming technologies of the past are being replaced by digital beamforming uh, technologies. And again, it's because the ORF data converters are now available and the technology uh, can support the speeds required on the digital domain. Um, and just, uh, de just going further into one of those applications, which is your base station. Um, so here um, in the fabric, uh, we implement uh, digital pre-distortion in particular. So that's where uh, the, the, the power amplifier at the output We'll exhibit some non-linearities. We digitize the output of the uh, power amplifier. And then we try to pre-distort the signal going into the power amplifier so that you get a linear characteristic. Um, that requires an awful lot of DSP. Um, so uh, we have the processors which calculate, for example, the coefficients associated with the DSP. Um, and we also have some control and configuration running on a second processor in the MP SOC. 
Uh, we've also got JSD interfaces, those serial, stand serial interface standards that I talked about at the start, talking to the data converters off chip. So um, there's two ways now to implement this. You can use the standard MP SOC uh, from Xilinx, the, the multiprocessor SOC. Um, and there you would talk to the external data converters on the lower left uh, using Surdays and uh, using JSD 204B. And these are the data converters, and uh, that's the interface, and there's your fabric, et cetera. Uh, with the ORF SOC, those data converters um, come inside the device, and we get rid of these, uh, these interfaces. So, um, you know, if you look at a base station application alone, um, if I compare a discrete implementation for 8x8, 100 megahertz radio, so that's eight antenna, uh, each uh, supporting 100 megahertz, um, we dissipate about 55 watts in a radio head system. Uh, with the ORF SOC, uh, through the, um, the low power of the data converters themselves implemented in 16 nanometers, also the fact that we've removed the Surday's interface, um, we end up with about 27 watts versus 55 watts, which is highly significant in a radio application which is passively cooled on top of um, you know, an antenna. Um, we also get additional benefits in terms of form factor reduction. So you can see here, using the discrete solutions, you've got four external components, each uh, with a 15 by 15 millimeter uh, footprint, and then you've got the 35 by 35 millimeter footprint of the, uh, of the FPGA itself. Uh, but with the integrated ORF SOC, you stick with your 35 by 35 millimeter footprint, and you've got the integrated data converters inside. So, you know, trying to get eight channels onto a single board, all of the area counts on the board, so the integration of those uh, data converters really frees up space. So, uh, concluding remarks. Um, so, what I'd say is that the um, ORF data converter integration, it does uh, enable the migration of these ORF functions in the digital domain, and then you get all of the advantages of flexibility, power efficiency, low system cost, weight, and size. Uh, the, fi the FinFET technology itself, surprisingly, supports really good analog performance and also very high-density, power-efficient digital implementation. Um, the RF SOC itself, um, it actually can address a broad set of markets, so not just wireless, but also wired, test and measurement, radar, imaging, etc. Um, and if we look ahead beyond 16 nanometers, now that we've got these RF data converters, it really allows a lot more innovation then on the digital side um, all of that signal processing can be taken advantage of to, uh, to reduce the overall system cost of the uh, radio designs. And there, I'll, there's just a, uh, a chip plot of the design that we have um, sampling to customers at the moment. So um, thank you very much for listening, and i um, happy to take questions now. Thanks, Brendan. OK, we have a question over here. Uh, yes. Hi, this is David Paul from Wave Computing. I have a question. Uh, I have been familiar with uh, the digital calibration techniques uh, that have been used uh, starting in uh, 65 nanometer. In fact, we have done ourselves in a previous, uh, my last two previous jobs for the last almost, almost 10 years now uh, with Boris Marman's students who started this in 2007, the first PSD came out. But uh, I have a question uh, about the ADC. On the DAC side, I understand that when a transmitter, you have multiple channels, uh, uh, there is no issue with respect to dynamic range. But on the ADC side, when you are digitizing many, many channels, and there are many, many subscribers on the other side, and they have different uh, path loss, et cetera, et cetera, your dynamic range would be different. Correct. So is uh, what you could do for one channel, say digitize ADC to 12 bits, I I'm assuming maybe the uh, effective number of bits is maybe probably, probably 10, 10 and a half, as, where 12 is nominal. Uh, but then what would that be if you digitize, say, uh, 2 or 3 gigahertz? There will be a wide dynamic range. And is your 14-bit nominal or 13-bit nominal, I think, I'm not sure what you... Is that enough? Or because I saw initially when we did the calculation for SDR uh, several years ago, and there are uh, articles that were published, people thought it uh, requires 22 bits yeah. or 24 bits, something like okay. that. So that's the question I yeah, have. Yeah, that's for. a good question. So um, generally, we've moved away in communications from effective number of bits now. It tends to be uh, the noise, uh, the NSD, so the noise floor. 
and also the IM3 and the um, SFDR. Um, what I would say is that um, you, know, you can't just continue to add channels, you're correct, in the A to D side. Um, so one of the advantages of this technology is it allows you to implement multiband. So I could synthesize band one, band three, band seven, seven for example, theoretically. Um, and also I can digitize those bands as well. But there definitely comes a limit where at some point you need to increase the dynamic range of the A to D converter. You can't just digitize everything in the, in the spectrum, right? Now that's also where you know, uh, filtering, for example, comes in as well. You know? So uh, both on the input side um, and also on the, on the DSP side as well. So I would agree with you that um, you can't simply digitize the entire spectrum for a radio application, including GSM um, carriers, for example, which would really swamp your uh, dynamic range. But if you look at typical radio applications, there's no doubt that we can, we can digitize a number of bands. So we'd be looking at least two or three bands to digitize simultaneously with, an, with a single A to D converter. Correct. Thank you. And I, I think for cable application, if you put it at the basement and it's going to apartments, uh, it'd probably be fine. Yes. Uh, yeah, yep. yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, if we just have time for one uh, quick question. Yes. Uh, quick Bill Rash from Intel. What can you say about special requirements on the process to do all of this? And would such a process also support FPGA type functionality in the future? Yeah. So there's absolutely, that's one of the requirements that we had. We, we have a, you know, and Xilinx is a platform company. So essentially what you do is you design your central product and then you create multiple derivatives. So you can't drive additional um, analog features, uh, so additional masks, for example, to support the analog. So everything, it's, it's, it's the closest thing you will get to a digital implementation of RF data converters. Everything is standard transistors um, and uh, a lot of digital calibration then to mitigate any of the disadvantages associated with those, uh, with the power supply or the transistors themselves. And FPGA I, I'm, I'm afraid uh, we've got to we've got to stick to the schedule. Maybe you guys can talk afterwards. Yeah. So, thank you very Great. much, Brandon. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker. Come on out, Sergey. This is Sergey Shumarayev. I hope I got that right, from Altera and now Intel. He's going to talk to you about their system and package platform and especially about the interconnects uh, that enable them. Yeah, Rob, thanks for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody. I would like to share with you today a heterogeneous platform that we've developed at Intel. Um, but let's start first with motivations. If you look at the uh, chart on the left, uh, you see the scaling of the feature sizes for the silicon and the, and the package. And the, and the silicon and package scaled at different rates. And as such, disparity uh, was created. And that what led to the need to create the service as the means to connect the dice together. And then as disparity grew, then uh, increase in the serialization requirement also emerged. And, and as such, in uh, high-end platforms, you see Transceivers take 30% of a die area and about 30% of a total power. Meanwhile, another trend is the manufacturing cost uh, that, that went up and the yields went down. And, and here you have it, large non-repairable area allocated to analog on a very expensive process nodes. So what you have is increase in complexity and system latency that and the power is introduced uh, by transceivers, as well as now long couple development cycles if you want to monolithically um, execute on, a, on a analog and digital together. So and uh, business result of that is that high non-recurring engineering costs and long time to markets uh, of, of deployment of such complex systems where every component needs to be nearly perfect for the whole system to function. And here comes the light bulb. What if there was a high density packaging technology? And if it could close such a gap, would it enable heterogeneous integration? So let's take a look. But first, I think it's worthwhile asking the question, if such a technology existed, would it be in line with the Moore's law? So there is no better way of answering that question than asking Gordon directly. And more specifically, going into his original paper, framing more components onto integrated circuits. 
So when you get to about the third page of the paper, it's a four-page paper, uh, then there's a section eight, this day of reckoning. And I'll read some of that. So as Gordon points out, clearly we will be able to build such component cramped equipment. But next we need to ask, under what circumstances should we do it? The total cost of making a particular system function must be minimized. To do so, we could amortize the engineering over several identical items or evolve flexible techniques for engineering of the large functions so that no disproportional expense need to be borne by any particular array. And then he skips, I'll skip a few lines, and then the conclusion remark in, in that section was, it may prove to be more economical to build large system out of a smaller functions, which are separately packaged and interconnected. So here, we, here it is, heterogeneous is part of the Moore's law. In fact, according to Gordon, it can give more of more. So now, first let me uh, spend a couple of slides to share with you embedded uh, multi-die interconnect bridge technology that we developed at Intel. So actually, it's, um, so here's a normal cross-section of the package, and it's hard to see there, but there is a, a small sliver of the silicon that is embedded into the into normal packaging substraint. So if you zoom in into that, uh, it's just a silicon that has uh, several routing layers, and uh, here what's shown is the four routing layers, and it has the pod layer on top of that. So now, um, how would you build the system once you have this technology? Here's our flagship um, uh, product. Um, has the um, Intel's Hyperflex FPGA uh, die in the center, and it has uh, several chiplets around it, uh, transceiver chiplets on the left and right that are connected via EMIP, as well as the DRAM that is also connected via EMIP. So if you take another cross-section, um, it's again, small EMIP bridge, uh, that just connects the two dies together. It's also worthwhile looking at the bumps. Here you, you see uh, C4 bumps and the micro bumps co co in coplanar coexistence side by side. So you could have arrays of the C4, arrays of the micro bumps, just according to the, how you place the bridges. As you probably aware, there is also an interposer technology uh, available. So I decided it might be worthwhile to compare the two. So on top you have an EMIP, and on the bottom you have interposer. So now let's look at the various uh, section of the um, EMIP. It's only localized digital connections that travel between the die on the EMIP. Your normal, the rest of the packaging, like RF, other IOs or powers are completely unaffected. You could have multiple bridges that connect the dies together. If you look, on the other hand, on an uh, interposer technology, uh, you need to have one big interposer that is as big as all the dies combined so that all the dies can sit on it. And if you look at the signals as they travel, actually all the signals need to go through the, um, um, through the interposer not just the digital signals, but the sensitive RF signals need to travel through the TSVs. If you look at um, fabrication and assembly, we have one less assembly and one less fabrication uh, step here. So we have a, what we have in effect is a cost-effective, high-performance solution. And um, another point north, uh, worth noting here is that there is no reticle size limit here. Now you can build a system that as large as your package. And if you sort of take a mental ratio between the reticle size and the package size, there's probably five to six X difference. You can build a very large systems here. All right, so now we have this uh, interconnect technology and um, how, would it, um, how would it compare? Where should it sit between our conventional technologies? So what you have on the left is the, is the onboard interconnect that is covered by transceivers, and there is a multiple standards there, PCI Express, uh, CPRI, and, and so on, and DDR. Uh, these standards are designed to cover large distances, up to meter, up to 40 inches, um, and they operate in a, in a neighborhood of the 20 picajoule per bit, and even that is probably an optimistic number if you consider all the protocol layers and the, and the MAC layer that is added there. And then on the other extreme, you have on-die connectivity. On-die connectivity is about 10,000 times smaller in distance. It is in, um, uh, is in sub micron, um, in, in sub millimeter range, the distance traveled. Power is 
about 0.1 picajoule, and there's also standards there. So with um, high density packaging, we've closed now the gap. We can offer multiple um, connections, and the distance, and, and this is on purpose, I took the um, picture of the backside of the die. So you could see the dies are sitting close to, to one another. In fact, uh, the distance between the, di the dice is 100 microns. So as such, the distance now traveled on this, on this connectivity is in the millimeter range. So about 1,000 times less than uh, on-board connectivity. So you should expect the power in a picajoule range. And we have developed a couple standards internally at um, uh, Intel, and I would like to share some of the details of the standards just momentarily in the slides to come. So if you compare onboard connectivity that is done with transceivers and uh, on package connectivity, you have about 20x decrease in interface power and nearly monolithic type of capability. So once you have technology available and you want to define the standard how to travel, um, there, there is a choice to be, to be made. Um, so the graph on the right, I would like to slowly walk you through. Um, on, the, on the x axis, you have um, density bre uh, breakdown density of the of the of the connections. On the y axis, you have a data rates, and then you have a constant contour of the bandwidth. Bandwidth is expressed in gigabytes per, mi per millimeter. So, for example, if you wanted to have a system that needed to carry one terabit of data and hence um, two triangles there. So in the case of, um, to satisfy that ben bandwidth, in the case of the EMIP, you would, uh, you would utilize a simple digital signaling, and IO would need to run it about 2.2 2 uh, gigabit, uh, and the bandwidth will be met with such a density of a connection. So if you start operating serially, then you need to have a larger, a larger spacing and distances, and uh, in that, in that case, you would need to operate at about, operate at about 20 gigabits. So obviously, the, the second solution with a 20 gigabit operation is not really a scalable solution, right? You, you can't really increase the bandwidth any, any further. And plus, you're on a very steep curve uh, there where um, any fluctuation in, in your design approaches could lead to the large impact in the power and latency. So what we've... By examining these options, we've adapted EMIP with a simple parallel I.O. circuitry and um, for the reasons I've, I've described. And it also uh, leads to the lower power and lower latency and uh, larger scalability. Okay, so now let's build a platform here. So, so our, again, flagship die, and I zoomed in into the EMIP section of that. And uh, you have a an AIB on a, on a chiplet site, and you have an AIB on FPGA chiplet site as well, and um, you have the digital data streaming, and as well as the abandoned bandwidth on a, on a control and a status signals that flow between the two dies. And the AIB is just a small sliver on that chiplet container, and, the chip, and it also has some auxiliary analog and digital functions, but largely container is intended to place that your target analog IP, and if, you have a, if that analog IP requires digital IP, you have a choice of putting it into the chiplet as well. Um, so now it becomes like a Lego block system, right? So as opposed to building one monolithic die that needs to address all the applications, why don't we uh, decompose it? On top, uh, you have uh, a 10 nanometer and a 14 nanometer FPGA dies. Um, Technology is obviously uh, different between the two, but what's in common between the two of them is the, those AIB ports. We also have AIB and UIB interfaces that we can enable uh, ourselves and our partners to design their chiplets. So, for example, HBM memory could be also on a two different uh, AA on a different foundry and on two different technology nodes. And what's in common bet bet between those two is the common UIB interface transceivers could be, again, on, on yet another foundry with um, yet another two different technology nodes. And again, what's in common between, between them is this simple AIB interface. On the bottom right, I'm just showing also that the, um, with the EMIP, 
and this platform approach, the chiplets don't actually have to be rectangular or square. They can, um, they can be larger than the AIB interface, if, for example, they are on older technologies. Or if you need a, a fewer transceivers or fewer, fewer data, data converters, you could have um, a, a smaller IP than, than, than the AIB port on a FPGA side that you connect to. The same goes for the UIB. So now we have this system of uh, that this platform with these chiplets. So now let's take it for a ride. Uh, um, before I do that, a few important points, I think, a few important observations there. So what we're able to do here is to mix uh, various technology nodes and the system requirements into the single device. From a noise isolation point of view, this is absolutely superior. So uh, as the prior speaker mentioned, that FPGAs are very, very noisy. This is the most noisiest um, circuitry that I'm familiar with. And probably the last thing you want to do it is to put it side by side with the analog. So what's the better way of isolating than having them on a separate substrate? So if you look at the example on a, on a, a top left corner, we have FPGA, transceiver, and high bandwidth memory that is a, from three different foundries and actually proven to provision to operate over six technology nodes. As such, we decouple here ASIC, FPGA, and analog and RF design cycles. So now, uh, I mentioned the word chiplet a few times in the platform. It's worthwhile to define it. So what's a chiplet? Chiplet is a functional, verified, and reusable physical IP blocks. It is realized in a physical form. In effect, it's like a Lego block. It could be a processor, it could, it could be a converter, it could be memory, it could be anything. Then, with either 2.5D or 3D um, technology, system and package technology, you now can assemble high-performance system. And they are now created just like uh, your Lego blocks by, um, by assembling the chiplets together versus building a dedicated monolithic die. And the platform needs to have a simple governing rules so that you don't have a uh, round peg going into the square hole. As long as, the, as, long as that connectivity is defined, then, then you have a, a Lego block system. So I've mentioned UIB and the AIB. Uh, let's spend a slide talking about them. So we've, we've, by analyzing them, several applications, we, uh, we came to a conclusion that perhaps there is a, a couple different classes of applications, and uh, interface requirements might be somewhat different between them. As such, uh, UIB, Universal Interface Bus, although maybe it's not such universal if, if it only covers a portion of the applications, uh, was generated. And the purpose was to serve HBM memory as well as the ASIC. AIB, on the other hand, was created for the wireline transceivers, but, third, but then afterwards it was generalized to support other use cases like uh, analog and RF. At the line level, um, lines are programmable, and they can op operate up to 2 gigabit per physical line. It's at the physical level. All right. So a closer look to the, um, to the AIB here. Again, I'm showing the, the micro bumps, and um, if you look at this sort of chiplet, um, then to the, um, to, the, uh, to the left of it, uh, is the C4 bumps and the micro bumps extent of a portion of the um, digital um, section, um, but they are servicing uh, the, the AIB. You could, uh, in addition to separated substrate from noise point of view, you could also see the power separation, where we have analog power, and as it's intended or needed for the specific target IP that you might have in mind, the digital power, if required for that chiplet, uh, also can be supplied separately. And then through the uh, micro bumps, uh, there is this MCP power that, that is common between the two dice, and that's what gives the level translation uh, between the dice. We then further subdivided the chiplet into the 24 user channels and one auxiliary channel for the handshaking. And then uh, if you look into the architecture of the AIB itself, you have an AIB phi, then you have a redundancy maxis at such a large um, uh, count of the micro bumps, redundancy repair uh, was an important function um, to service. So it's, uh, we have redundancy fuses that are blown and uh, links are repaired. But then after that, there is this lightweight uh, AIB 
adapter that is added and that abstracts away the physical uh, file la layer details, including the redundancy repair from the end um, IP provider, so that IP designer can just focus on IP design, and then magically things just happened over the bridge for, for them. OK, so now let's play with this Lego blocks. So why don't we start with the six port um, 14 nanometer uh, Stratic stand die. We can put transceiver and um, we've just built a product. Then we start with another die. Now this die has both AIB and UIB ports. So now we can bolt very same transceivers to them in the package and then HBM memory. And now we have a whole family of products where we can put, in, in this case, transceivers and, uh, and, um, and the memory. Now let's do system upgrades. So historically, for you to do the system upgrade, upgrade in the monolithic die, you would need to respin the whole, the, whole, uh, the whole die. But in this case, you would just remove the chiplets that you don't need. You might choose to put 10 nanometer FPGA, and it just connects to the older chiplet. You might have a new generation transceivers that you want to add. Sure, why not? And maybe new generation memory. And now you have a system upgrade done in the package, very fast. You know, time to market is, 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 is everything here. All right. So next, why don't we just let our Im imagination sort of run wild here. Um, so here I have a container. Um, IP that I put into, in, into, in this container, um, AIB and the EMIP are, are agnostic. So let's, let's just let's have some fun. So we can put the CPU. And here comes another next generation system. We can put converters. And that will open new product opportunities. We can put machine learning. We can put optical. And maybe later we want to put uh, some hardened logic. Why not? Again, just like a, just like a Lego blocks. Sort of in a conclusion for the, uh, for the SIP discussion here, what we have here is efficient and scalable in integration using the EMIP technology. And we were able to now converge the process nodes and the system requirements into the functional multi-chip module uh, that mixes, um, mixes process nodes and the, and the foundries. In a, in a physical layer, we have a high efficiency um, connections. In fact, there's over 20,000 um, EMIP, EMIP lines. Each of them is capable of running two gigabit. So the just sheer bandwidth is just is, um, is enormous. The fact that we can build the systems that are larger than um, than the reticle now uh, over is if you look into overall system design, it gives you ability to reduce size, weight, and and power. So I have a couple more slides. Let me start first with the summary slide. So what we have is a heterogeneous integration for that propels more of the Moore's law. Intel MIP technology is, uh, is a cost-effective and high-performance offering. Programmable in interfaces as AIB and UIB gives you ability for the flexible attachment. And this talk really is not about any specific product. Uh, Stratix is the new class of product. It's actually a platform. It's a heterogeneous platform. Before I make my final remark, I would like to give you a teaser and specifically um, mention DARPA. Um, DARPA have um, put forward the BAA uh, last year for the program called CHIPS. Common Heterogeneous Integration and IP Reuse Strategies. And the program is just about to kick off tomorrow. So I would, I would expect um, more developments and more news coming, uh, coming our way. And the intention of the, of the program is to um, create ecosystem of the chiplets that uh, have plug-and-play capabilities and with the common interfaces between them. So I think there is a motto come here. With that, um, let me ask a sort of a provocative question. If one were to build stuff monolithically, that would presuppose that a given company has 
ability to innovate in every single aspect of the chip design. Are you aware of, of the company that has a monopoly on innovation? I, I'm not. So my argument here is that heterogeneous integration is, gives you ability to innovate with partners. That's my last thought, and I thank, thanks for your attention. And I'll leave it to the questions. Very good. Thanks. Hi, uh, Fred, Fred Weber, Program Chair for Hot Chips. Um, so this, all the innovation that you make possible there really rests heavily on the EMIB, essentially the ability to make a very, very fine line package. Uh, how real is that? Uh, what, what kind of yields? What kind of availability? Uh, okay. Um, no, actually, we could. It doesn't rely only on EMIP. It could. It could. It, it needs the high bandwidth uh, package. Um, you're right. But such packaging technology is also available from Global Foundry. Is available from TSMC. So there is a in, interposer technologies that are available. Available there. If you. Um, so it's not just a look to the EMIP. I obviously have a preference of, you know, of EMIP or of other technologies for the, from the um, cost point of view uh, and, the, and the yield point of view. Um, we've, done the, if, we've done the cost analysis. And in, if, you do the, um, if you do the monolithic die, and again, this goes, goes back to the, uh, I assume you're 25 or 30 percent of your area occupied by the transceivers. And FPGA is a highly repairable um, die. And the yield of FPGA in a monolithic form is totally determined by the poor yielding 30% of analog area. So if you now, and that's a cost, if you now take the 30% of the area out and you put it on an older technology that is more mature and plus it's a, a smaller chiplets, even though you might pay premium for the interposer or IMIP, actually that premium will be offset by the savings that you are doing by, by not having analog on the most expensive, expensive processes. Hope that answers your question. Well, I, I mean, I totally get the architectural desire to do that. Uh, I, I haven't seen those interposers, those multi-chip approaches take off because they never seem to hit the, the price and, and yields that they promise. So no, in, in a... Um, Again, what, what you will see from uh, uh, Intel common is that um, high-end and mid-range system are, are common on 2.5D. So the cost analysis are, um, and I, would, and I would, would argue that the same would apply at some point in time to the CPU as well. So when you, again, when you look at the, at the large system and the and ability to yield them, um, actually becomes cost effective to do it on interposer. I would agree with you for the low cost families. So this is where maybe interposer is, um, is too expensive. Any other questions? I'm a, okay. Hi, uh, Bruce Akilani from NVIDIA. Uh, can you comment on what the limits are to your micro bump pitch and whether like, what are the physical limits that are okay. restricting it to 55 and whether you think you might be able to push it down in the future? Yeah, the 55 is the pre is a present commercialized uh, bump pitches. The next generation would be um, 35. And uh, if you were to sort of ask the roadmap, I don't know, that's seven years out, then certainly in the labs you see bump pitches like a 10, 10 micron bump, bump pitches. So obviously the density of the interconnect is quadratically growing with the bump pitches. So I think the roadmap is... Is, is quite long there. So is that just with RDL or something? Second. Is that just with RDL or something? Like uh, no, just the physical, 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 you know, bump, bump spaces and, and bump, bump distances that you can create. So yeah, again, I would expect the next generation to move to the 35, which would lead to two and a half x increase in the density of, of the of the bump pitches. Please. So I think uh, EMIB is really uh, compelling and. Uh, you know, apropos um, silicon interposer especially, it seems like the cost would be a lot better. Would you, I guess I have a two-part question. One is, uh, w would you have a kind of a rough estimate of the relative cost of EMIB versus silicon interposers today? Hmm. You know, In I, terms of manufacturing, let's say, not, let's, not the final price. Okay, and what's the second part of the question? The second question is, you know, 
the, the premise of chiplets is very compelling because it says that, like, you know, the, we can sort of break up the SOC and then, you know, as you said, uh, you know, it'd be really nice to not just have a single company have a monopoly on innovation. Uh, but with Silicon Interposers, um, you know, it's, it's like the sort of high volume customers and the most important customers that kind of get access to that. And so it's sort of, even though the chiplets idea is, is you know, maybe democratizing silicon, mm -hmm. in practice, silicon interposers are not, you know, democratic at all. It's, they're very expensive, you know, it, it doesn't really work that well with the idea. It seems to me like EMIP could, but then, you know, I, it comes back to what you said about a single company having a monopoly on innovation. So my question is, you know, is, is can I go to Intel and have them be my packager and use their EMIP technology? Okay. So on the, on the first question, um, I, 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 to be honest, I'm still looking into the comparison between the interposer and the and the and the EMIP. and this is the um, uh, I think hard to really compare because I think both the Intel would would keep this cl 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 close to its chest and uh, information like this, and so would the Global Foundry and TSMC. But to the first order, I would argue it would be function of the. Uh, of the size difference between a large interposer that is big as uh, as the as the reticle versus small sliver. So I think it would be proportional to that. The second sort of order uh, to that would be how many EMI bridges you you put, and if you put too many of them, then you start having a yield fallout because you have too many bridges. So there is a the right number of bridges to to be have. On your on your second part of the question. Um, I, I, um, and this is where I'm arguing that, look, uh, Intel has the EMIP, but um, Global Foundry and the TSMC have a, have a, have a COAS, have, have an interposer technology. So there is at least you know, three foundries that I'm, that I'm aware, and I think that should drive the cost down. Um, I, I think if the business model is right, Intel is certainly would, would uh, uh, would be would build high volume uh, stuff. Um, I would imagine Global and TSMC has a broader offering, but but there is no monopoly per se on a, a high density packaging technology. It is available from a few places. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great, Nathan Brookwood, Insight 64. Intel's been talking about EMIB for a while. <coughs> excuse me, a while now. Are you saying that it is ready for prime time, or are you talking about something off in the future? No. So when? No, it is. We are, we are prioritizing this. So this is already this is already product that is that has been in in the field. And then yes, you're right. Intel has have many, by the way, technologies that that they have developed and put on a, on a shelf that they are ready for the application. Altera was, um, before acquisition, the first user of the EMIP. Uh, but then what I'm seeing right now is Intel large volumes coming on, a, on, a, on, a, on the EMIP. So it goes for the prime time right now, absolutely prime time. And especially with regard to the heterogeneous uh, nature of the, the combinations you were talking about, how do you deal with the known good die issue? Uh, I, ign I acknowledge that known good die um, is the important uh, to address. And uh, right now, uh, with HBM, for example, solution with our memory provider, we are not, by the way, building the HBM memory at, at Intel. We have arrangement where they have a known good die HBM shipped to us. And so with the transceivers, we have internal, internal testability that, uh, that gets you to the known good die before you put it in the packaging substrate. So, so yes, I acknowledge that uh, it, 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 it is key to this technology, and it, it, uh, right now it's solved based on the um, details of each chiplet here. What memory needs is different, obviously, from wireline line transceiver. It's a good question. Yeah, All right. thank you. I, I think we're gonna have to close uh, now for uh, time. Um, so further questions uh, uh, separately. Thank you very much, Sergey. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Uh, our next speaker is Gaurav Singh. He's Vice President of Architecture and Verification at Xilinx. He's got over 20 years of experience in silicon design, architecture, and systems. He has worked on ARM, MIPS, PowerPC, and X86 designs, in addition to switching fabrics and uh, networking silicon. He's chair of the C6 Consortium, has a master's in VLSI from USC. Uh, Gaurav? Yeah. All right, I'm, uh, I'm connected. Uh, glad to be here. Um, before I start, I do want to acknowledge all the different uh, authors who helped put this presentation together. 
Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge the team at Xilinx who keeps cranking out these devices. You saw the previous presentation from Brendan on the RF SOC. I'm going to be talking about uh, our uh, HVM integ and C6 integrated 60 nanometer device. So jumping straight in, marketing asked me to use the name that they came up with, so I'll try and stick to that name. It is called the Vertex Ultrascale Plus HPM. That's the name of the family. It's our fourth generation 3D IC using the TSMC COAS technology. It has up to three 60 nanometer FPGA die, up to two HPM2 stacks, lidless package, up to 55 millimeters. The base die itself has been enabled uh, with memory controllers and hard switches, and I'll go into some of the details. 2.8 million system logic cells, close to 10,000 DSPs, 340 megabit SRAM, which includes the BRAMs and the ultra RAMs, very high dense SRAMs, 96 32.75 gigabits per second series, 8 100 gig Ethernet Max with RSFEC, 450 gig interlock and max, 6 PCIe Gen 4 by 8s, four of them that incorporate the new C6 technology. And as I mentioned, up to two HBM in package DRAM stacks. Here's a product family. I won't go into the details. It's in the USB drive if you need to take a look. But there's, uh, we can have up to four devices using the same technology, all the way from a single die, single HBM stack, to three die, and two HBM stacks. So the agenda for today is I'm going to talk about some of the application drivers. Now, as you can imagine, with a hardware programmable devices, there's lots and lots of uh, applications. I'm just going to cover two, so you just get an idea as to what are the decisions we made. I'm going to talk about some of the changes we had to make to the design to incorporate HBM. I'll also talk about some of the package and thermal considerations around HBM. And then I'm going to talk about C6, or the Cache Coherent Interconnect for Accelerators, which is a new spec uh, from the C6 consortium, and I'll talk about how we supported it. So diving straight in. Data center and networking, these are the two applications that I picked. So in the data center, what's really important is for vision processing and CNN and DNN type applications, you require high compute. Um, so we've got lots of DSPs, give very good um, operations per second. For natural language processing, those applications tend to be extremely memory bound. And this is where the high bandwidth of HBM memory really comes in handy. For any accelerated device, the interface to the processor is of utmost importance, and that's where the PCIe Gen 4 and the C6 ports comes in. C6 also enables seamless heterogeneous shared virtual memory connectivity, and it really makes shared virtual memory that much more efficient. And there's also memory expansion that is possible over C6 because C6 has the basic load store semantics. On the other end, networking, what is really required uh, is lots of high bandwidth interfaces, especially when you look at 400 gig networking. So there's 96, 32 gigabits per second interfaces, 800 gig max, interlock and max, lots of LCs to do P4 processing, and 3.6 terabits per second of HBM bandwidth for very, very efficient packet buffering. So how, what we started off with was the, the base ultrascale plus FPGA design. And this design is already in production. So most of the components in this design are already shipping today. Things like the GTs, the DDRs, the Ultra RAM, CMAX, all of the LUTs, CLBs, they're already shipping. What we did was we added on a silicon interposer the four gigabyte density HBM stack, and we added two of those. Each of those stacks has an extremely high 230 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. So with two, that's about 460 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. We added hardened memory controllers for HBM, and I'll get into some of the details of the controller. We also added a hard AXE switch, and I'll also explain why we had to do that. And then, of course, we have the PCIe hard IP with the C6 transaction layer. And as you can see, there's a familiar cross-section there that shows how the different components get connected over the silicon interposer. So here's some of the benefits of HBM. Uh, what I'm showing here is two, uh, it's a comparison. On the left is the VU9P, which is our flagship device. And it's a VU9P that's connected to eight gigabytes of memory over two traditional DDR4 channels. So there's two channels of DDR4. 
Um, and on the right is our new HBM integrated View 37P, which with integrated HBM. And as you can see, the bandwidth is from 85 gigabytes per, uh, gigabytes per second to all the way to 460 gigabytes per second. So there's about a 5x improvement in bandwidth alone. But what is, what is the most interesting is that that higher bandwidth comes at a much higher, about a 4x improvement in the power efficiency. Right? So it's roughly around apples to apples, about 27 picojoules down to 7 picojoules. So that really is the benefit of HBM, that you get all of this bandwidth with um, at, at a much more power efficient point. Now, obviously, with the HBM bandwidth, with the in-package integration, there's a limit as to how much you can scale. So that's one of the disadvantages. But the other thing with, that the additional memory bandwidth buys you is, as you can look at the cartoon on the, on the upper right, really, memory bandwidth enables much higher performance. It's good to talk about tops, but as we all know from the roofline charts, that at some point, you tend to get memory bound. And with the increased bandwidth in memory, it really enables and unleashes this additional uh, performance. So now I'm going to talk about the HBM integration on the die in the design. Uh, so here's a diagram. If you look on the bottom right, uh, that's the architecture. So what we did was we have the traditional FPGA fabric. Uh, we added AXI ports that come out of the FPGA fabric talking to this AXI switch interconnect. And it's a hardened AXI switch interconnect. And that switch interconnect talks directly to the hardened memory controllers. That again talks to the HBM5 and I.O. There is an option to bypass both the switch and the memory controller if our customers choose to do so. Now, just a quick primer on pseudo channels, because this is something that's typical of HBM memory and it's architected in, is that a pseudo channel in HBM is a pair, uh, a pair of pseudo channels share command and address buses, and they have separate data buses. So each stack or each memory device has 16 independent pseudo channels. Now, what's interesting is that each pseudo channel can only address 1 16th of the memory of HBM. And therein lies the problem, right? If you really do want the bandwidth, you need to have the full connectivity, which, which HBM doesn't natively give you. Now, on the, uh, in my architecture team, we modeled that. We modeled what it would take to build one of these switches. And what we found was in order to build the switch in soft logic, it would actually end up occupying a good amount of the, the, the resources. So that's what led us to design and architect the AXI switch interconnect. So now you can have a master sitting on our uh, AXI master sitting on one of the interfaces. It not, not only gets the bandwidth, but it also gets the full addressability of both the HPM uh, die. The other problem that we had was with the huge amount of bandwidth that comes in, and it comes in at a fairly narrow uh, portion of the die. And in order to be able to sync this bandwidth into the FPGA fabric, what we, what we did was we added these fingers. And the reason we added these fingers, so we depopulated some of the logic on the FPGA side, and we added these fingers to add more surface area. And that allowed us to better distribute the bandwidth in. Now, just to let you know, so as you saw the comparison, that's a huge amount of bandwidth. But we wanted to make sure that we could actually really be able to use the bandwidth in its, in its, in its full extent. Uh, update on the memory controller. Uh, each memory controller has uh, two AXI ports. Uh, it has 64-bit, uh, 72-bit uh, channels. Uh, it runs at half rate. It has reordering capabilities. It has full support for ECC. It has parity protection on data with, re with the retry support. So this is a hardened memory controller, which is fairly, fairly sophisticated. And as you see from the performance numbers, actually, we're quite happy with how it's turned out. Now, putting it all together, I'm going to show some, some real results from the design. And this is taking a master that's sitting in the fabric and the soft logic, connected through the switch, through the memory controller, and on, onto the memory. And so in this example, we've got four masters talking to four pseudo channels. And as you can see from the left bars, uh, this, is where you, this is typical of most applications, where you have reads and writes going on simultaneously, and the addresses tend to be linear. So there's a linear block of addresses that the masters are sending out. And you can see that we, on the read and the write, we have about 90% efficiency, which is pretty good. The one in the middle is a, a, more of a stressful case. This is where you have multiple masters, and every master randomly picking a pseudo channel to send its transactions to. And then in turn, within that pseudo channel, it's picking random uh, addresses. So when these transactions funnel into a memory controller queues, the mem memory controller sees lots of different random accesses. 
and the memory controller has to try much harder to keep the efficiency high. And in this case, you see that the performance goes down a little bit, but it's still above 60%, 70% for reads and writes. So overall, this sort of justifies why we did, and we were pretty happy with uh, the decisions that we made. So now I'm going to talk about some of the physical and the packaging and the thermal considerations, because integrating HPM, there are a few things that you have to keep an eye on. So first, I'll start off with some of the issues that we had in the packaging. Now, these have all been solved, but I thought I'd just talk about them to give you a flavor as to the kind of issues that we ran into. The first was just incoming residue on the HBM microbumps, uh, and this was handled by process tuning and uh, inspection. Then obviously with a larger package, 55 by 55, we uh, very carefully looked at the coplanarity and the warping. And as you can tell from the reflow chart, we are well within the spec. There were some reliability challenges such, such as underfill crack, and these were addressed by stress tuning and process improvements. And today we have over 1,200 hours. We are passing over 1,200 hours of high temperatures storage and the temperature cycling. So it's looking pretty good. Now, one of the challenges with HBM is the max junction temperature. HBM has a, the devices have a max jun junction temperature of somewhere between 95 and 96 degrees C. And that is something that we have to keep an eye on when we, we do the thermal design. And I'll show you some of the details. Now, the cross sections there are interesting to look at. You can see the cross section of the, uh, the, the stack up. Uh, what's interesting is that you can see the HPM die, you can see the base logic die, and then you can see the microbumps connecting it to the other memory die on top. On the right is the FPGA die with the microbumps connected to the silicon interposer and, the, and then the bumps on the other side. The one on the right is a zoom in uh, as well. So now I'm going to talk about just the, on the thermal side. So what we did was, so here's a PCIe card, and this PCIe card has multiple of our VU37P devices. Uh, and these are very dense devices with lots of performance. So, you know, with four devices, let's just call it about 100 tops, right? So 100 tops of performance within a PCIe card. So we set up to see if we could actually cool it. So we made some assumptions in terms of the airflow and the typical ambient temperature, and we simulated, simulated this. And you can see the results on the lower right. And it's, it's, it's interesting to see we slice the die so you can actually see the temperature uh, of, of the different die. Uh, and it's not surprising that the bottom die, which is a logic die, has the hot spot. But you can see that we're getting pretty close to the temperature uh, of, of 95, 96 degrees C. So with, with this thermal solution, we're, we're confident that we can actually keep it cool. But one of the things that we learned is that about HPM, each die as you stack up is about a 2 degrees C thermal gradient. So when you have five die, in this case it's four high stacks, a so logic die plus four die, that's about a 10 degrees C gradient between the top to the bottom. So that's just something to keep in mind. So if, if, if you ever think of integrating HPM, we're using a four high stack. So if you decide to use an eight high stack, that problem is only going to get worse. So this is something that to keep careful attention. Uh, and we're, we're very confident that based on all of the thermal analysis that we've done, that we can actually uh, meet, meet the requirements. So next, I'm going to talk about C6, or the Cache Coherent Interconnect for Accelerators. This is a new standard that a group of companies started working on about a year ago. Uh, and when they started working on it, it wasn't quite sure where it would go, but I think based on the groundswell support for it, the consortium incorporated earlier this year. So I'm going to talk about uh, the um, reasons for C6, so why C6. Now, this is an interesting topic, and depending on who you talk to, Moore's Law is alive and kicking, it's slowing down, or it's just resting, right? Now, <laughs> irrespective of that, one thing that is clear is that heterogeneous compute is here to stay, right? The future is about heterogeneous compute. It is about CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, TPUs, NICs, accelerators, what have you, right? All of them within a system in a tightly coupled configuration. So then the question to ask is, what is the most efficient interconnect for this heterogeneous system, right? The characteristics of this interconnect are obviously higher bandwidth. You want to have as high bandwidth as, as possible while being efficient. Low latency, nobody will argue against that. Uh, what is also useful is to be able to leverage existing ecosystems where they are available. Now, existing ecosystems from a hardware point of view in terms of connectors, cabling, system form factors that, are, that have you know, stood the test of time over multiple decades. But what is also important is to leverage the software ecosystem because in some ways that is a harder thing to drive. Right? So this is all the operating systems uh, that, are, that have been deployed in a large scale. Newer applications are also now moving towards tiny data transfers, right? So it's not about having a large chunk of data that you farm to an accelerator 
but it's about smaller data transfers, 32 bytes, 64 bytes, 128 bytes. And in fact, with the storage class memory, that's even a requirement for lower, right? So this interconnect also needs to be efficient with lower data transfer sizes. But why currency, right? C in C6 stands for currency, so why currency? And the answer to that is quite simple, right? It's really to simplify the programming and data sharing model. Today, ac accelerators are not that easy to use for those of you who've used them. There's a lot of overhead. You need software drivers. You need to pin the buffer in memory. You need to set up DMA descriptors. So it's not, very, it's not straightforward to use them. So the goal of C6 is to be able to use accelerators by as simple as passing a pointer. Just like you have a two-socket Xeon system and you can pass things back and forth, it should be as simple to pass things back and forth between accelerators. Now, especially when you look at the future, where you'll have lots of these disk discrete accelerators, all of them working together, that is what is needed. So if you can dream for a moment, right? think of a you know, IBM processor, maybe an AMD processor, an FPGA, a GPU, maybe a TPU, all of them living in harmony in a single system, happily sharing memory and data together. Right? Well, never mind. Right? It's, much, it's much more fun to compete. All right, so C6 summary. This is where we are. Uh, with the C6, uh, the gen generation one, which is the 25 gigabits per second, is already defined. Uh, it's backward compatible. As uh, one thing I may not have mentioned, that it's uh, by using existing ecosystems. What I was referring to was PCI Express. PCI Express has a vast, vast uh, you know, ecosystem already. So it is backward compatible with 16 gigabits per second, all the way down to 2.5 gigabits per second. And as and when Gen 5 comes along, it'll, be, it'll work with Gen 5 as well. This full capability in the accelerator, so the accelerator can have, uh, you know, full, uh, you know, can host memory, can be a home agent, uh, it can be a requesting agent, slave agent. Uh, flexible topology, as I'll flash a uh, picture uh, after this. Um, and it's really optimized for multi-chip transfers. So there, there's lots of things that have been done to the transactions. For instance, low overhead header formats, uh, message packing and simplified messaging where possible, request and snoop chaining, port aggregation. So there's lots of innovations that have been built into the specification to make that transfer a lot more efficient. The one thing with C6 is also it's getting full ecosystem support. So there's IP available, there's interface IP available today from Cadence and from Synopsys. Uh, there's coherent controllers available from ARM. ARM announced their Porter IP that's, that has full C6 support. NetSpeed is doing a lot of good work with C6 IP, and so is Arteris. There's full suite of verification IP available from Cadence, from Synopsys, from Avery Design Systems. So if you were a silicon vendor today thinking of incorporating C6, it, it's, it's quite straightforward because a lot of the IP is already available. Uh, and there will, there's a lot more uh, standardization that's coming out in terms of the, the, uh, the system software as well. So anyway, so c6consortium.com if you need more information. So the system topologies, um, there's multiple different, again, when you think in terms of heterogeneous accelerators within a system, you want to be a, a, a allow different topologies. So there's obviously on the upper left is the direct connection between the processor and the accelerator. Uh, there's the processor connected to C6 attached memory, uh, which because C6 allows native load store, low latency accesses. So for this new class of memory, that's uh, going to be an early deployment. The benefit of using PCIe is that you can, it can work over standard PCI switches. So you can, for instance, have a C6 device on one end of the switch, and you can have a PCI device on the other end of the switch, and both these transactions working simultaneously on that same link. Then there is the scale out where you have the processors and multiple accelerators where you can actually pool multiple accelerators and be, have all of them be part of the same memory uh, domain. And of course, if there's PCI, you can still do the scale out with, with, with the uh, FPGAs or accelerators. So now going to our design, uh, this is what we did. We started with a base PCI Gen 4 controller, which is already quite feature rich. It has full support for SRIOV, ATS, PRI support. And what we did was we added the C6 capability. So you can see the stack. The stack on the right is the stack that we've implemented in, in, in this device. It includes the C6 transaction layer. And the stack on the left is what our processor partners are implementing. So it's just sort of showing the two stacks on both the sides. Uh, but on C6, we added the ATS PRI capabilities. We added the C C6 DB stacks as well. Now I'll show you some of the performance uh, results here. So this is for us, what we've seen is right off the bat on the transport itself, we see about a 30% reduction in latency by using C6. Uh, and this is just a start, right? Uh, and I think in terms of implementation, it can get a lot better. But right off the bat, we, we see about 30% reduction in latency. 
And then from the protocol packet efficiency, you can see that the, uh, at the lower end, C6 is really delivering on the promise, and you can see a much higher utilization at 32 byte, 64 byte, 128 byte transfers. And even as you get to the higher transfers, you can see some of the benefits of C6 efficiency coming in. And the interesting thing that we found was we, our architecture tends to be very columnar. So we have these columns, and we have the PCI controllers built into this column. So when we set out to put C6 into that column, what we found was that we were able to incorporate C6 into the same die area. So pretty much, C6 came for free in our implementation. right? So for something that was free to get 30% lower uh, latency and much better efficiency, it, it, it's, it's a pretty good deal. So to summarize, I'll again use a full term, Vertex Ultrascale plus HPM. Summary is it's a scalable family, four devices, uh, one to two HPM two stacks, four terabytes of aggregate memory bandwidth, 32 terabytes of int 8 machine learning operations, 3.6 terabits per second of HPM bandwidth, perfect for buffering, current low latency host interface with a C6, switchless peer-to-peer -peer shared virtual memory that is uh, modeled as enabled by C6, 96 lanes of PCIe Gen 4, six PCI controllers, and four C6 controllers. So with that, I'll end my talk, and I'll happy to be answering questions. David Cantor, uh, Real World Insights. So um, you made a very logical choice to uh, capitalize on uh, the PCI Express lower layers, which is great for economics. Uh, but that's a uh, clock encoded rather than clock forwarded architecture, and that has higher latency. Whereas, you know, IBM and Intel on all their coherent links, those are all. Uh, clock forwarded. Uh, what is the uh, additional latency penalty you pay for the smallest packet size? Sure, sure. Yeah, so we looked at that. Uh, and if you notice that we are using the data link layer and the, and the physical layer of uh, PCI Express, in terms of the old, now we could have invented our own, right? Done everything from ground up. Now, there's obviously a huge benefit to use what we have. And in our experience, the latency improvement was about maybe two cycles. So we're looking at maybe three to four to five nanosecond-ish range. Uh, but I think in the grand, the one thing to keep in mind is that the, even while we say coherency, it's not meant to be fine-grained coherency like two processors share the same data, right? It's really to be to make the shared virtual memory model a lot more uh, efficient. And at what point do you think you will need to use forward error correction over that link? Yeah, so uh, we've uh, till the 25 gig, we don't need forward error correction at all. Uh, we're looking at the next generation, which is 56. And there is, we're looking at uh, to see. And I think a lot of it depends on the system topologies, the type of material you use, and what reach you're looking for, right? If you're really looking for long reach, um, and I think it's interesting to see whether 32 gig even can do long reach with, with VEC, without VEC, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, yeah hello, this is Ian from Samsung. And I have a question on the C6, uh, kind of two part question. The maturity and the adop adoption of the, the standard. So. I guess uh, from you mentioned that the one of the driving reason for the coherence of the C6 is to allow the true sharing, global memory sharing programming model. But uh, I was looking at in the uh, protocol today, there's really no support for DVM about today. So how does that work with the, the global sharing memory model? And then if you can comment on the rate of adoption of C6, either any partner have uh, Take the lead on uh, sure. making a product with so it. So maybe I'll ask, answer the second question first. Uh, I think in terms of the adoption, you've seen that a lot, there's lots of IP already. Um, we've announced our first part with C6 support. Uh, there are multiple processors that are also putting it in uh, in, in their designs uh, and IP availability. So I think it's coming along pretty well. Your first question, I wasn't sure if I understood it correctly, but I think were you asking for uh, the availability of uh, no. DVM support? You mean when you you need to manage page translation between different uh, IP connect through that uh, Got it. interface. Yeah, so I think the, the so what, what C6 does is it, it, it leverages the PCIe address translation support, right? So that that's, that's already exists. Uh, there are some changes, minor changes that, that are, are required. Uh, but overall, if you look at it from a shared virtual memory paradigm, that already exists today, right? Okay. Great. 
Th thank you very much, Gaurav. Our next speaker is David Pellerin. He serves as a business development principal for high performance computing at Amazon Web Services. Prior to joining AWS, Mr. Pellerin had a career in electronic design automation and hardware accelerated reconfigurable computing. He has experience with circuit simulation and synthesis, grid and cluster computing, and embedded systems for image, video, and network processing. He has published five Prentice Hall technical books. David Pellerin. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. It's great to be here at, uh, at Hot Chips. I want to um, kind of follow up on the technical deep dives into uh, current state of the art with FPGAs and really talk about the motivations for why you're seeing these now in cloud, and specifically the F1 instances that, uh, that are now available on AWS. Some of the use cases, some of the development tools that are available today, and again, the, the motivators for having accelerators uh, in general in cloud services. When we talk to customers about acceleration uh, who are currently using cloud, we often have to talk in an abstract manner. And this is obvious to, to many in this audience. But the, the reason that we use acceleration is to take advantage of massive levels of parallelism, right? So if you think of uh, a good metaphor this, for this would be the business jet versus the Shinkansen, right? So the CPU being the business jet, it goes really fast. It's got a limited number of seats. And it's really flexible because you can turn and go to all kinds of different destinations, right? It's flexibility and speed. If you think of the Shinkansen, that's all about throughput, right? Thousands and thousands of seats. It doesn't have to go as fast. But if you want to move thousands or even millions of people, from one uh, place to another, that's the way to go, right? So what does this mean for acceleration use cases in the cloud? Increasingly, uh, in cloud environments, uh, big compute, a very high-scale compute uh, is performed because that's where the data is, right? So that's one of the major reasons why customers deploy at scale on cloud. And many of the new use cases that are, that are being deployed for big data, for big compute, for high-performance data analytics are natural fit for acceleration. And GPUs have been used for acceleration of the cloud for quite some time. So you think about what's happening at scale with deep learning training uh, using MXNet and other frameworks on the cloud using GPUs. It's, it's a big use case. Also, uh, things like rendering, right? So image rendering for visual effects and so forth. Big, big use cases for GPUs in the cloud. But many of these applications that are acceleratable are also a great fit for FPGAs. And then we know this because FPGAs have been around for quite a long time. There's a lot of research around this, a lot of success in creating hardware accelerated appliances. So it's just natural to see these now migrating to the cloud if you have a platform uh, in the cloud that can be accessible by developers, by software partners to serve their end customers. So our strategy now in AWS is to really uh, have acceleration uh, with a variety of platforms. On the GPU side, we've got acceleration uh, platforms for graphics. We've got acceleration platforms for compute. I mentioned deep learning training a moment ago, but there's many others in financial computing and the like that are currently taking advantage of FPGAs at scale. Excuse me, GPUs at scale. So now with F1, this is really the first offering that we have with, with hardware accelerated computing. And our, our goals that I'll describe in a few moments really, really make FPGA programming and this environment really not so different from GPU programming. It's still not trivial if you're a software developer, but it should be much easier than it has been in the past in the world of, say, embedded systems. So there's a wide range of compute instance types, as we call them, on AWS. These compute instance types are optimized for particular types of use cases. Uh, for example, we've got C uh, family instances that are higher clock speeds, higher core densities. They're optimized for compute-oriented workloads. We've got memory-optimized instances, storage-optimized instances, and, you know, unique, specialized hardware that we virtualize and make available to customers. Well, now acceleration is part of that picture, right? And actually has been for some time, as I said before, with the GPU families, all the way back to 2011, 2012 with our... Tesla-based CG1 instances, right? CUDA programmable, um, you know, allowed developers who are familiar with the NVIDIA, NVIDIA ecosystem to quickly develop accelerated applications in GPUs. And then today we've got the, uh, 
the, the P2 instances with the NVIDIA K80s. We've announced Volta coming later this year. Lots of things happening on the graphics side as well for acceleration on the cloud. On the FPGA side, of course, the subject today, F1 instances with Xilinx UltraScale Plus FPGAs. So our goals in offering FPGAs in the cloud and, and the way that we're offering them in the cloud is really make them uh, available as instance types, as virtual servers, if you will, in the cloud, not really so different from other instance types, right? The FPGA is, is there, it's available, it's on a PCI Express interface, the tools are there, but from an infrastructure perspective, the F1 instance looks very much like any other instance type in AWS. You can deploy it in your applications just as you would any other instance type. Another very important goal was to vastly simplify the development process, in particular by providing the FPGA development tools in the cloud, right? Another goal is to simplify the development in terms of where you focus your energy as a developer. If you've done a lot of FPGA development in the past, you know that it's not really so much the development of the algorithm itself that's a challenge, it's often the I.O. How do you set up the interfaces? How do you figure out what the, what the board level design is and so forth? So if we can extract, abstract away as much of that as possible, then we can make much faster progress in FPGA accelerated applications. And then when those applications are completed, when you know, startups or, or uh, existing ISVs with interesting solutions that are hardware accelerated get something working and get it done, how do they take that to market? How do they monetize it? So we want to provide a marketplace for FPGA accelerated applications. We think about the architectural decisions for developing an FPGA uh, accelerator, right? There's lots of lots of ways that you could architect that. As I mentioned before, we really want to make the F1 instance which is our first foray into hardware accelerated computing, look very much like other EC2 instances. So it really is a coprocessor acceleration strategy. The architecture is really not so different from what we do with our P2 and our upcoming P3 instances, which are a standard EC2 instance with a PCI Express connected accelerator. In this case, the accelerator is the FPGA. Now, the most efficient applications for this architecture are going to be those applications where you do send a relatively large amount of data from the host to the FPGA. Streaming is a great way to think of that, right? Large transfers into memory on that PCI Express board is a good way to think about that. Big, chunky data, right? Very important, as I mentioned, that we allow developers of complex applications to view the FPGA instance, this EC2 instance, as being not really that different from other EC2 instances. We have many, many architectures, many, many application patterns on the cloud that involve uh, the use of virtual private cloud for security and, and management purposes that use things like auto scaling to automatically scale up and down the infrastructure, add servers when needed based on certain rules that may connect to different types of storage environments, right? These are complex architectures, and it's very important that the FPGA instance be able to just drop into that existing architecture. For example, in financial computing, in your compute architecture, drop in GPUs, drop in FPGAs through automation if possible. So super important that we then make that simple. The only really new concepts for the FPGA, for the F1, would be the idea that you have to develop the, the, uh, the bitstream, right, the Amazon FPGA image, using FPGA development tools and manage that AFI in a way that's perhaps a bit different from managing other infrastructure, in particular Amazon machine images, AMIs, on the cloud. So today, the F1 instance is available in two sizes. So think of us as of taking a, you know, a, uh, a server architecture with, with eight PCI Express cards and delivering that either as the entire uh, eight FPGA uh, box, if you will, or, or instance type, or cutting it up into smaller uh, single PCI Express interface uh, sizes, right? So we have a T-shirt sizes, as we say in, in Amazon. The 2X large is the single FPGA. The 16X large is actually the eight FPGA implementation. And you can see correspondingly that you get uh, more CPU cores, more memory. So we're just allocating uh, portions of that, of that uh, server 
for those instances. Now, each PCI Express card that has the Xilinx UltraScale Plus VU9P also has local memory. It's got local uh, DDR4 memory. There's also interconnect, so if you're using the largest one, the 16X large with eight FPGAs, there's a PCI Express fabric uh, provided so that you can have FPGA to FPGA connectivity. There's also a ring interconnect. So for streaming applications, for example, you could take advantage of multiple FPGAs in the platform. I mentioned this AFI before, the Amazon FPGA image. So that's where your uh, user's bitstream, the FPGA bitstream, has been encapsulated, encrypted, given a unique identity, and now can be loaded onto the FPGA under software control. And because it's under software control, you don't have to take down, you don't have to reboot your, your EC2 instance to do this. You can just swap in different AFIs over time, and it's, it's really quick. So the idea now is if you're a software application developer or maybe an ISV providing some solution to, to customers is that you can deliver the AMI, Amazon Machine Image, and one or more AFIs that go with it to provide that uh, complete working application. So I mentioned before that it's very important that we make development process for FPGAs a lot easier. And, and one of the simplest ways to do that is simply make the FPGA development tools, in this case Xilinx Vivado, available on the cloud, right? So you don't have to download the software, you don't have to set it up and manage it and get the versions right and so forth. Uh, another aspect of FPGA development, as you probably know, is that it requires a fair amount of uh, local compute uh, to do things like you know, synthesis and place and route. These are, these are big, challenging problems from a compute perspective. And so having the ability to run those in the cloud and select uh, AWS EC2 instance sizes that are best uh, sized, if you will, and have the performance needed for a really big uh, place and route problem is, it can be very helpful. And in fact, you could think of doing multiple uh, place and route runs, right? If you're trying to close timing, you want to use different build strategies, you could do those in parallel now in the cloud, which is much more challenging, as you probably know, doing it on your desktop. If you're uh, used to doing um, hardware level design, uh, you know, using uh, blinky lights and probes and so forth, uh, virtual JTAG is available, so you can use ChipScope, for example, to, to go in and, and probe. There's virtual LEDs, for example, to get that kind of a hardware level experience, even in that cloud environment. So this, uh, this development environment, this dev AMI, as we call it, is available on AWS Marketplace. Uh, it's free. You have to pay, of course, for the compute resources, the EC2 instance that you're running it on. But an important, uh, important benefit here is that you don't have to use the same EC2 instance type throughout your development process, right? So maybe I'm just doing uh, front-end uh, design and simulation. I'm just running a lot of RTL simulations on some portion of my design and iterating on that for a few days, perhaps. You don't need to pay for a big, expensive um, server to do that. You can use one of our smaller instance types, maybe even a, a T2, which is very low cost, to do that front-end design work, to do that uh, initial simulation. And then when you're ready to push the button and run uh, synthesis and place and route, maybe run parallel, uh, parallel place and route runs, now you can begin to deploy uh, the big iron, right? The high memory, high CPU instance types for those purposes. So you can pick and choose the infrastructure that's right for the part of the development process uh, that you're in. I'll talk now about how we're making the, the I.O. problem a bit easier. So if you've done um, FPGA design, hardware design, you know that a lot of the time is spent not on the core application itself, the, the core algorithm, for example. A lot of your time is spent on, on figuring out the I.O. So when you buy uh, you know, reference cards uh, from FPGA vendors or third parties, uh, oftentimes they come with reference designs, right? Uh, that designs that show how to push data in and out, how to use DMA, how to access memory. So similarly, on AWS, with the F1 instance, we're providing what we call the FPGA shell. And the FPGA shell encapsulates things like the memory controllers for, for your DDR4, 
the um, FPGA link, which is that bidirectional ring I mentioned earlier, uh, access to the PCI Express card, and so forth. So as an application developer, you're going to focus on your custom logic, your CL as we call it, and not have to focus so much on I.O. So you don't, you don't have the pinouts, you don't, you, know, you don't have access to that information on the outside. You focus on your custom logic. We combine that with the shell to create that AFI, that Amazon FPGA image. And we do this by taking advantage of standard interfaces, Axie interfaces that are, that are published by Xilinx. Uh, there's nothing really exotic about those interfaces. If you've got um, experience using Axie interfaces, using Xilinx tools, it should be very familiar to you. To dig a little bit deeper into that FPGA shell, you can see that there's uh, things encapsulated in it. Uh, and by the way, we use a partial reconfiguration to, uh, to encapsulate this. But uh, you'll see, for example, that one DDR4 interface is encapsulated in the shell. But because we don't want the shell to be overloaded with features that you might not use all the time, three of those DDR4 interfaces are kept out, and you synthesize those in with, with your design. right? But for the most part, we're abstracting those interfaces, in particular the PCI Express interface, into the shell, into a partial reconfiguration region that you will combine with your uh, custom logic to create that AFI and communicating, as I said, over these AXI interfaces. I mentioned before hardware simulation, right? Hardware simulation is, is very, very important. And um, as we all know as hardware designers, uh, one of the worst things you can do, and many uh, beginning FPGA users make this mistake, is to ignore simulation, write some code, push the button, run place and route and synthesis, wait and wait and wait. Maybe they didn't even make timing. And then they try again, and then they try again. And it's, it's very important that we emphasize to customers, to new developers of FPGAs, or even existing developers of FPGAs that are familiar with smaller density FPGAs, that that, that process is relatively quick, that simulation is, is very important. So the use of uh, the Vivado simulator or other third-party simulators, uh, super important that we support this uh, in the platform, and we do. And so this is typically done do, doing remote desktop. If you want to do this on a local machine, let's maybe I've got a, you know, a nice setup with VCS or something on my local machine, we do provide the necessary uh, libraries and IP so that you can do that simulation locally as well. When you get back to the synthesis process and the place and route process, uh, as you know, if you're an FPGA developer, there's lots of, of, um, lots of paths you can take, right? Lots of, of tunings that you can do. And this is why, as I mentioned before, uh, many experienced FPGA developers will set up a farm. They'll set up uh, multiple place and route uh, environments uh, with different uh, seeds, different uh, constraints, and so forth, uh, either to meet timing or to explore the design space. It's, it's really quite common. This is easier to do, of course, in the cloud when you can spin up multiple virtual instances <clears throat> with the development tools. To help uh, FPGA developers, we do provide a set of, of uh, build strategies, uh, you know, a limited set of build strategies. They can, of course, uh, create their own and customize. But these build strategies make it easier for them to maybe get results quickly, right, with a basic, uh, basic build strategy. Or maybe they want to focus on, on higher clock speeds, getting timing closure, so a timing strategy. So we do provide these. We document them. And this has been very helpful for those FPGA developers who are relatively new, as I said, to high density, high utilization applications uh, because now they're moving applications to the cloud that either previously were in a completely unconstrained um, environment of, of their own FPGA and board and design to maybe the new, new FPGA, the Ultra Scale Plus VU 9P, or maybe they're completely new to FPGAs entirely. We'll talk a little more about this design flaw. I've mentioned a number of times the AFI, the Amazon FPGA image. Similar in concept to the Amazon machine image, right? Which is a machine image you can capture, you can store it off, you can repeat it. It's really your way of encapsulating your operating system of choice, patch levels, applications, all of that into a template that you can save off and bring up later uh, through automation to create a repeatable infrastructure in the cloud. 
The AFI, of course, is, is very similar. It's your bitstream, encapsulated with the FPGA shell that you save off, it's encrypted. You combine that with the AMI through uh, software APIs or through command line to load up the FPGA or the FPGAs, in the case of the larger F1 instance, to create that application. Now, creating that AFI requires that you use the Vivado design tools, do your front-end simulation, do your synthesis, your place and route, you generate what's called a DCP, a design checkpoint, right? That DCP encapsulates your custom logic that has interfaces that will interface, of course, with our FPGA shell. You submit your DCP into tools that we provide on the cloud, it ingests that, combines it with the shell, and creates the AFI. And again, that AFI is encrypted, it's given a unique identifier, you can now deliver that to your end customers in a secure manner on the cloud, if you're a FPGA software developer that's creating some new unique offering. So AFI is a really important concept, and that's what allows us to de deliver FPGA logic, FPGA applications in a secure manner via marketplace. As a developer, you need to think about the hardware side, and of course, you need to think as well about the software side. So we provide an SDK for the software side. The SDK has two basic uh, uh, categories of, of, of uh, APIs. You've got management APIs to do things like um, load and unload AFIs from the, uh, from the FPGA. And it's got runtime uh, APIs. I want to push data back and forth over DMA, for example, right? So you've got to have APIs for that. That's the sort of thing you find in the SDK, and that's combined, of course, with your application on the software side. Again, in the interest of time, I'll move fairly uh, quickly through this. Again, those management APIs load the local image, right? So load that FPGA. You can access virtual LEDs and so forth. These are the sorts of functions you get on the management side. And on the runtime side, this is where you're communicating uh, reading and writing data from the FPGAs. Wanted to mention now that uh, you know, recently announced that we're supporting uh, OpenCL in the environment. So if you're a user of OpenCL, uh, whether for the interfaces or for the, for the compiler tools that are evolving now, uh, OpenCL is supported now in F1. So just as I described with the SDK and the HDK, the hardware development kit, OpenCL supports both. You've got a software side um, and a host code, and you've got the kernel code, right, that's down in the uh, FPGA. Again, I don't have time to go through the details of the design flow, but uh, we're here available if you're interested in the design flow to answer questions afterwards. And I think uh, Gotti Hutt is here. Gotti, uh, as well, can answer questions on OpenCL support and on the tools. So I want to emphasize again this, this process. Uh, for software developers, this is all kind of new because, uh, you know, it's not like the old days of just compile link ran a, a few seconds or a few minutes. FPGA compile and link synthesis and place and route takes significantly longer. But once you're through that, you've got that DCP generating that AFI and managing that AFI, loading and unloading from the FPGAs is really quick and simple. So AFI creation is really important. That's done um, through uh, APIs or, or using uh, services that we provide as endpoints on the cloud to ingest that DCP to create that securely encrypted uh, AFI for use in applications. I mentioned before this, this idea that you can do remote uh, hardware debugging using uh, ChipScope. If you're familiar with, with ChipScope and, and, and these uh, you know, logic analyzer types of experiences, this is very, very helpful for tracing specific signals right in the FPGA. And uh, many of you are, are deeply familiar with using these techniques already, uh, but it's relatively new for, for software developers. The idea that you can now instrument the hardware, get that data back, um, because it's a virtual JTAG environment, you could actually do this on your local machine. I mean, on your, like your desktop, right? You can run ChipScope and have it tunnel out over TCP to the FPGA. So you can run ChipScope locally and, um, and analyze the data in the FPGA in system. Talk briefly about the marketplace. The marketplace on AWS has existed for quite some years. There are literally thousands of software products already being offered on marketplace from 
very large um, organizations, uh, SAP, for example, or Cisco and so forth, they're offering their solutions on Marketplace today for customers to deploy uh, in their virtual private clouds on AWS. And this gives uh, developers of hardware accelerated applications a, a path to market now that they really didn't have before. Think about the challenge, um, and many of you are familiar with the challenge, of developing a hardware appliance, maybe for genomics processing, maybe it's a financial computing application, maybe it does uh, video processing types of applications. That hardware box and delivering that into a customer's data center that might be a very secure data center simply to do a product evaluation, right? Let alone deploying it in production. The path to market for hardware accelerated solutions in the past has been very, very challenging. Well, now in the cloud, so many of the customers that are going to be most interested in hardware accelerated solutions are already there. They're doing satellite image processing. They're doing big data of all sorts, deep learning training, uh, many, many applications now in the cloud at extreme scale. And the data that's there available to process at extreme scale. So offering FPGA-based solutions, hardware accelerated solutions to those end customers on the cloud, perhaps via their software partners, uh, is a very, very compelling to FPGA developers. You can go deeper on these topics, on the SDK and the HDK and, and the architectural decisions that are made by visiting the discussion forum that we have on aws.amazon.com. It's forums.aws.amazon.com. Uh, you, can, you can hear about the, the latest uh, around OpenCL, for example, and, um, and on uh, the use of the tools. So I want to thank everyone for the, for the time today. I know this wasn't uh, the deep technical session of the previous sessions, but I really wanted to help uh, establish the why. I mean, why are we doing all of this from the cloud perspective, from an accelerated computing perspective, and what the opportunities are for those that are working on hardware accelerated applications and the underlying uh, chip infrastructure. Thank you so much. David. Thank you, Robert. Thanks. We, uh, why don't we start over here? Uh, hello, yeah, I'm Oliver Gunasekra from NG Codec, and we were actually the first company yes, to of course. get an yeah. app on, uh, on the uh, F1, and we're, we're really enjoying it, and we now have our application in the marketplace. Uh, but my question is, um, right now the FPGAs are in US East 1 data center. Uh, what are the plans to roll that out to other data centers, as we have some customers in Europe and, and Asia that like to get local access? Yeah, so um, thank you for the question and thank you for being here. So NG Codec was actually the first uh, uh, partner, uh, preview partner to uh, demonstrate an application running on F1, which was at our reInvent conference last November. And I think you had like three weeks to get it going from, from zero and uh, it was pretty impressive. Um, yeah, so you know, it's, it's day one, as we say, for, uh, for F1 instances. They are available today in US East Virginia. We do have plans to roll them out um, more globally. I don't have information to share, unfortunately, about the schedule and about the specific regions at this event. But come and talk to us and talk to Gaudi, as I know you have um, around this. We're, uh, we're listening to customers. Uh, customers drive everything at Amazon, including uh, decisions about the architecture, about uh, regional roll rollouts and so forth, and the tooling. So, thank you. Over here. Yeah, Peter Atashian, Naval Postgraduate School. A uh, quick question on partitioning. So, is F1 allowing you to do partitioning of a large design onto multiple FPGAs, or is that done manually by the developer? That is done manually. So, the question is uh, around partitioning, right? Can you auto partition across multiple FPGAs? So, the, the 16x large, the largest F1 instance, provides eight FPGAs on eight PCI Express cards, and the connectivity between those is going to be with a PCI Express fabric uh, and with this uh, 400 gigabit um, bidirectional interface. So uh, it really is up to you as a developer to partition your application across those multiple FPGAs and figure out the most efficient data movement between them. Okay, well, thank you very much for bringing subscription services to FPGA design. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Oh, over here. One more. Uh, Sagar Karandakar, UC Berkeley. Um, I just want to say thank you for, bu for building this platform. Uh, we're really excited about it. Uh, we've ported a lot of our simulation tools that work around RISC-V uh, to F1 already. 
Um, so sort of related to that, uh, right now there are very large FPGAs in F1. Um, so we're wondering if there are plans to perhaps add smaller FPGAs and perhaps make them available under something like the AWS free tier uh, to customers for perhaps like educational purposes. Oh, that's a great question. So yes, the, the VU9P uh, Ultra Scale Plus is a very high density FPGA. There's, there's well north of two million uh, system logic cells available to, to developers in there. So you can put a whole lot of risk, risks in there, right? Uh, risk fees. And, um, you know, for educational users, we do have academic programs and credits to get access to these. So, so you know, come and talk to us. If you don't know about those already, we can, we can hook you up. Um, we are focusing on applications that are, that are large. Uh, and you think of, of, you know, video processing, you think of genomics processing, financial computing, these things, they do take advantage of, of large-scale FPGAs. Having said that, we're, we're always listening to customers and partners about use cases that we haven't optimized for. So uh, bring those to us, please. Thanks. Thank you. We have time for one more. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, Rick Merritt from EE Times. I wonder if you could comment a little bit on this debate that we've been having before your presentation about different ways to do the next generation FPGA, different ways to package it with EMIB or uh, 2.5D or different interfaces that Intel and, and Xilinx have talked about, like C6. Uh, do you have any particular opinions about what you'd like to see in the next generation FPGA? Well, I, I appreciate the question. I can't comment publicly on Amazon's uh, opinions about architecture. You know, as I said, we listen to customers and use cases. We've chosen use cases today that are acceleration-oriented, right? That uh, there's a clear distinction between the software side and the hardware side. Streaming uh, interfaces are very important, for example, in those types of applications. Large-scale FPGAs, wide, fast access to DDR4. Uh, but again, I can't comment about architecture. It is day one for FPGAs in the cloud, and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing more. Great. Thank you. Thanks, David.